everyone. It's Gordon Einstein, your Dubai resident crypto blockchain, and I guess now AI attorney. And I'm doing something special today. I'm not doing the usual long format interview. I'm doing a flash interview because we have a, a very special guest who has a hugely busy, busy schedule and a release coming up. But I'm catching him, I guess, the day before. So I'm, I'm just going to jump right into it. We're going to do a longer interview later, but this is the before interview. The later will come later. This is the before. David Johnston, welcome to the show. How are you? Good to see you, Gordon. I'm doing great. How are you? I am okay. Let's get right into it. Why are we doing this? What's happening? So a lot of exciting news, but uh, staking on Morpheus is going live literally tomorrow. And the audits have all come back. It's looking great. The community has been doing all the test net stuff. And yeah, it's a big step for the community. For those that haven't been uh, caught up, Morpheus is this decentralized AI platform that emerged late last year. This is what Venice is building on. If you've tried their AI app, which is just incredible, it's a project by Eric Voorhees. So it's so cool to see the community all coming together, building different parts of this ecosystem. So yeah, happy to jump into that. Uh, let's do it. So parse out, here. Yeah, I think we got the whole show right there. Take your last <laughs> paragraph and parse out each element in detail. Go. Sure. So number one, Morpheus is a platform for smart agents, the way Ethereum is a platform for smart contracts. So it's giving builders who are making AI agents, letting them connect to Web3 wallets, right? So that you can take actions with smart contracts. You can send crypto. You can trigger decentralized applications. Like opening all of Web3 to AI is effectively what Morpheus is doing. And so there's four parts to that, right? It's providing the compute that everybody needs, it's providing all the tools and the code, it's providing the capital, and it's providing the actual platform for people to publish their smart agents. So let me break that down uh, to catch everybody up. When this start emerged in February, hundreds of millions of dollars of ETH came in and got deposited into the Morpheus Fair launch. And that provided the capital for the coding tools and bootstrapping the compute and everything else. And it used a really unique way of doing it. There's no pre-mine, there's no foundation, there's no company, there's no formal team. This is entirely decentralized and there's not even a treasury. Like where did that money go? The staked ETH sit in the contract and only donate the yield into the protocol on liquidity. So there's no custodian, there's no grants, there's no DAO, there's nobody holding anybody else's money. It's entirely built into the smart contracts, this bootstrapping mechanism. So this idea of a fair launch was sort of pioneered by the Morpheus community last February. And now over a billion dollars have gone through those smart contracts. So other people are doing fair launches using the same smart contracts that Morpheus pioneered. Right. And that's so cool to see. It's basically like a relaunch of ICOs minus the central parties, minus the custodians, minus the treasuries, all in smart contracts. Right. And so people have really caught on to this idea of fair launches. So if you've seen the fair launch recently of Noun Space or what 6079 is doing, all these projects have been attracted by that, this idea and adopted this same standard, which is now called More 20. So this More 20, this Morpheus 20. M-O-R-20, more 20, like Morpheus. Okay. Yeah, kind of inspired, let's say, by an ERC-20 uh, kind okay. of language okay. or terminology, right? Push this button, it creates a smart contract. Now you have your own token and can do a fair launch without the need for a company or a foundation in Switzerland or spending six months with smart contract developers or finding an auditor. Like these contracts have already been audited 10 times. Back. Right, like... It's effectively, you know, removing all the barriers for people to create their own fair launch. Honestly, I'm surprised nobody has sort of done it before. But this creates an easy pathway for anybody that wants to do that. So that's the capital aspect. That's one thing that Morpheus pioneered. But one aspect that wasn't live and is sort of part of the bootstrapping process is staking those rewards that you're earning, right? So if you put in staked ETH and you contribute yield, you're competing to earn the Morpheus tokens. So a quarter of all the rewards go to people contributing capital. But if you want to stake those rewards, you get an extra power factor. So that's the staking that's going live tomorrow. 
is this ability to say, hey, I'm long-term committed to this community. I really want to build decentralized AI. I'm going to lock up my rewards for a year or two years or whatever. And that gives you additional proportionality, an additional power factor in the calculation of your rewards. So I think this is sort of a key aspect and, you know, is obviously done by, you know, so many different protocols uh, to use staking as a way to reward people that are aligned with the protocol long term. So, yeah, it's all sort of coming together, but that's been the journey so far. So there's a lot there. The um... Let me ask a neophyte question. Is a decentralized network able to provide enough efficient compute to run an AI? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, people often confuse the compute needed for training an AI mm -hmm. with running the AI, right? Just sending prompts to it, asking it questions, getting a response. That's actually fairly low compute. You're mostly just storing the model in memory and asking it questions, right? And you actually need very little GPU power, right? The GPU power, you hear about these giant clusters, that's for training the model. But okay. once you have a great model, it's relatively low resource to ask it questions, which is called inference, right? And that's mostly what people will be doing on Morpheus is hosting models and offering them to users. And let's say the new Llama 3.1, which got announced yesterday, which is incredible. It's the first open source model mm -hmm. to pass all the benchmarks and surpass GPT-4 and Claude 3.5. Now the best model in the world is an open source model for the first time as of yesterday. And so that's that's a huge sort of you know inflection point they should be called where people... It, it should be called open. <laughs> exactly. And credit to Meta for, for releasing it, right? They released the weights and how to use it and put it under an open source license and said, here you go. This is the new Linux. This is the new uh, I, standard. I, I gotta ask, is, that, is it that special Facebook Meta kind of open source license or did they use something like Apache or MIT or... It's, it's not as purely open source as I would personally uh, like, um, but, you know, it's okay because what's going to happen is once you release weights in any form, immediately people download them and they start fine tuning them and they can release them under new licenses. So there's going to be an MIT, there's going to be, you know, Apache, there's going to be every version of this model under all the flavors of licenses. And they actually, you know, in this version specifically said, it's okay to fine tune. It's okay to release your own. It's okay to do whatever you want with this, which is okay, a big I, change. I'm asking like a lawyer, because I remember you and I having a similar discussion with our prior DAO experience, which yeah. we name unnamed. The, um, <laughs> does the license is under allow for derivatives to be released under a different license? That's my understanding. Um, and the thing is, even if they do, it, because what happens is as soon as a new model comes out, people start pinging in paying the API and simulating weights. Because if you take enough answers, a million answers, a billion answers, you can start to understand exactly what the weights of the models are. And so you can synthetically recreate the model uh, very quickly. And then effectively you've made your own model and you can release it as you want. So there's no really technical barrier. And that's what Google, I think, really freaked them out last year and why they pushed all the regulatory capture and the executive order and all these draconian rules that are coming uh, out of the administration since last October are because Google realized there was no technical vote, right? right so let's well, talk about that. There's, I think you yeah. alluded to, even before we started recording, that there's some regulatory hammer coming down like right away. What yeah. is that? So the executive order last October said, hey, AI is dangerous, be afraid, and, and we really need rules about this. And their rules are, there need to be licenses if you release a model. There needs to be permission from Homeland Security. There is now a safety committee at Homeland Security run by Microsoft, Google, and OpenAI. They kept all the open source advocates off this safety committee. Uh, and so you're going to need sprinkle the little holy water if, if you want to do something of a meaningful size as far as training a model. You're, you you love KYC, right? You loved it for your money? Welcome to KYC for your data center because now they have to prevent foreign people from using US compute. 
So the only way to do that is they're implementing KYC in all the data centers right now to block Chinese and other nationalities that aren't allowed to US, US or compute. And, and I saved the best one for last. The Commerce Department on July 26 in two days is going to determine if open source weights, just the database, right, that, that records the AI, you know, weights, if that is a dual use weapon. And if they determine it's a dual use weapon, which it looks like they will, it will be a felony to release a model without permission in the US to foreign people. Dual it's use technology. Yeah, it'll be a dual use technology, which means the munition, People which means it's a weapon. Non-civilian weaponry. Yes, correct. This is 1991 Crypto Wars 2.0, right? <laughs> all, all sort of like, you know, Mark Twain, history never repeats itself, but it sure does rhyme. You'll never guess the senator that introduced those 1991 restrictions to ban encryption for email. Do you, do you remember which senator that was? That was, was it Biden at the time? It was Joseph Biden. He's that damn old. <laughs> 33 years ago, right? Tried to yeah, ban I remember encryption. remember encryption being a munition and you couldn't export it. And I'm like, you know, it's, you, yep. you do understand it's math. You know, right. Like, this is this is just math. Like this is linear algebra. You're, it's you're not a gonna, statistical. You're not going to deny Chinese people math. Chinese people deny right. us math. <laughs> right. Yeah, good. Good luck with that. And so here we are again, 33 years later, and Biden is signed to this executive order to try to ban math again, this time in the context of AI. And so it's an export control, right? That's why it's the Commerce Department who's making this determination that you won't be able to allow to do this. Unfortunately, the EU has passed the same restrictions. That's the EU AI Act, which goes into effect August 1st, which is why Meta just announced after this model, they won't release any models in the EU because they'll be restricted. And the US is, it's gonna be the same thing in the US. They were speed running to release this model before the regulations go into effect in two days because they don't know what, they're gonna be able to get this magic new license to release models from the safety committee, which they're not on at Homeland Security, right? And so it's it's created this absurd, environment, it's it's crypto in 2014. The bit license is coming out. Get the hell out of New York. Where can you go? So far, the UK says they won't regulate models. The EU is regulating the models. China has kicked out all the models. The US is kicking out all the models. And so I expect it looks like it's going to be Singapore, UK, probably Switzerland will be the friendly places you'll be allowed to release these models and have access to math. So I, that's I, what's uh, been going on. Maybe you read it, and unfortunately I can't remember his name, but the, the gentleman who was at OpenAI and quit or got fired published this 100-page treatise. You, you probably read it. I can't, unfortunately, I can't remember his name. That we're basically in the next Manhattan Project-type race, specifically with China. And we're in the world of gigawatt data centers and meet and... It's the usual thing that, you know, the, the first, the, we are in an arms race, apparently, or about to be in one. And he made an argument for the types of restrictions that the government's not putting in place, and it wasn't unconvincing. It, it I, is I know, just I know purely the, the father it, of the dad, yeah. or at least the father of the naming of the dad. But do, do, you have, do you have any concerns that rogue or non-rogue regimes get their hands on this? and My... my... Well, no, my, my primary concern is AI will be centralized and it'll be in the hands of a couple of companies and a couple of governments. That's the worst case scenario. The best case scenario, which is playing out right now, is everyone will have access to intelligence. Everyone will have access to this best models. They will be open source. You know, I've gone all the way down the rabbit hole. I have yet to find a real technical thing to be afraid of. There, there is no way it's magically escaping the box, right? It is a statistical word calculator, right? It has weights. You tell it what you want to know. It goes through the statistics. It gives you back the most likely reply. It's not conscious. It's that, not going to be conscious. Model. Yeah, that's See, that's the, the heart the, of the what we're talking about. Was, you can, you can, the first thing that would be easy to automate is AI is automating AI research and you'll keep right. on getting better AI researchers working on AI. Yeah. 
to 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 quote Lord Acton, right? Uh, despotism lies in the centralization of power and liberty and freedom in the decentralization of power, right? And I'm paraphrasing, but you know that's that's the heart of this. Is you need everybody to have access to a personal AI. It needs to be open source. It needs to be free, right? If that's the best cybersecurity in the world. That's the best access to technology in the world. You know, for the same reason that people want a personal laptop or a personal phone, they're going to want a personal AI where they own the data. Oh, it's I not controlled by a company. Right. Yeah. Well, now it exists. So if you haven't already, download Venice.ai. So we're this is all the links in the show notes. So did, did, yeah. What, what is what is your role with this? So I'm an open source contributor. I think I've worked myself up to number two on GitHub. So you know, I, I dusted off my my engineering hat a few years ago and said, you know, this has to exist and this has to be open source, and we have to build this right now, especially after the regulations came out. Well, I started writing first about uh, the idea of smart agents connecting. It felt like that was the missing term, just like we memed smart contracts into existence. It feels like right now we're memeing smart agents into existence, which is an AI connected to your Web3 wallet, right? Because that puts the human at the heart of the equation. It's you with your wallet approving your transactions and the AI doesn't have access to your private key. It's authorized by your private key. That's the way we need to build these systems is with the human providing the intent and the purpose and the objectives and then approving the outcomes. Like that's the optimal situation here. Just like the early days of the web, the breakthrough of a search engine is I didn't need any technical knowledge. I could tell it what I wanted to find. It gave me the best options. I clicked on the top link. I had a good result. And that's how you got billions of people on the web, right? If you remember to the 90s, people were dismissive of the internet. It's for nerds. It's too technical. Nobody's going to use this thing. Nobody's going to do commerce on this thing. And then search engines came out and it gave us the interface we needed no, for to go more mainstream. Information for highway. That's right. That's right. Those long series of tubes, they, they put them all. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so, and so, but yeah, yeah. But we're at that same moment again, Gordon, this is web three having its search engine moment. It's where you can talk to the machine, tell it what you want to do. You don't have to know what a smart contract is. You don't have to understand any of the technology. It gives you a good suggestion. Oh, you want to stake your e Here's Lido. I lined up the transaction for you. Is this how many you want to stake? And you push a button on MetaMask and it just does it. We're talking about agents that can take actions on your behalf. And that's the is all the AIs today can give you information. A smart agent can take action on your yeah. behalf. It has an economic capability not bank accounts to AI. It's hard enough to get a bank account as a person, right? And so, you know, it's going to be Web3. It's going to be crypto rails that all the payments and everything happen with. And so the natural thing to do, what I proposed in my paper about smart agents, was to connect the wallets to the agents, will you, will you put the, the human at the heart paper? of all of I'll put in the show notes also? Sure, yeah. Okay. I want to I right. and, and, and after... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'll send you a link. But, you know, what happened after that is, you know, these anonymous developers uh, came along and published a paper about Morpheus and said, oh, this smart agent stuff is cool, but you have to have a network. There needs to be other people with better hardware, not just, you know, running it on your local machine that can operate these agents in the cloud, still connected to a user's Web3 wallet, but the hardware can be anywhere. Right. And that was sort of a stroke of genius. They proposed a fair launch. They proposed sort of some other breakthroughs. It disappeared. This was September, right before the executive order came out in October. And so <clears throat> when I was hanging out with Eric Voorhees at Permissionless, right after his speech um, in, I guess that was uh, October of last year, I was telling him about decentralized AI and the Morpheus paper. And he's like, yeah, this is the thing that has to exist. We can't lose access to intelligence, right? If 99% if of the future intelligence is going to be AI, I really want it to be my personal AI. I really want it to be working for me, not working for somebody else. And then the executive order came out and it was like, it put rocket fuel and fire under the community. It's like, they're going to ban math? I don't think so. We're building this right now and we got to get this out before wow. these regulations go into effect. So it's been a crazy nine months. 
So you're, you're what's happening? Where are you right now, Texas? Yeah, I'm in Austin. So what's happening tonight or tomorrow morning? So when the staking goes live, effectively anybody that's been earning more tokens, MOR is the token for Morpheus, by providing staked ETH or providing uh, code, will be able to stake their emissions into the future and basically show to the protocol and to the community, hey, I'm committed to the long term and I'm going to get a boost in my uh, rewards because I'm staking my emissions. Sort of a unique approach, right? Typically staking is you have an existing token, yes, right? And you're putting it in and say, I'm going to lock it up for a certain amount of time. But Morpheus is so early. There's only 2 million tokens in existence. It's a 16-year supply curve. There'll be 42 million will ever exist. Most of the tokens are in the future, right? And so for code and capital contributors, it's about locking up the tokens that they're earning now. And I'll be able to claim them in a year, in two years, in three years, whatever. On the other side, people providing compute or people building smart agents can stake the existing tokens, right? So that's the next thing that'll get developed in August is being able to put in your tokens and say, hey, I wanna be a compute provider, right? And I'm gonna earn Morpheus tokens, I'm gonna stake these for a year. Or I wanna release a, a smart agent and I'm gonna show them a good actor and I did an audit and it's not malicious, right? All those things I need to prove to the community for people to trust my smart agent, I'm gonna stake some uh, more tokens to show them a line. So it's really unique what's happening in Morpheus is sort of this idea of, staking future rewards and staking existing tokens across those four behaviors. And, and just to clarify, a lot of your audience have probably heard of Tau. They've heard of BitTensor, right? They've heard of Akash. They've heard of these other decentralized network. Morpheus is not competing with any of them. It's a customer of theirs. It's the demand side. It's using those models. It's using the compute that Akash provides or the models that BitTensor provides. Right. And so we've been holding these decentralized AI days and decentralized AI summits. And those are the speakers, right? It's bringing together the community and paying people for releasing agents and creating cool models and providing compute. Well, Morpheus is like mostly the incentive layer. I bring you to Dubai and you will do a decentralized <laughs> day here. It's going to be fun. We, we should do it. Right. We've done one in Austin and SF. We just did one in Brussels and London. It's we need to get Dubai. Yeah, don't don't let's, be anti-Middle Eastern. They're good people here. Get over here. Don't, don't be, don't I, be hey, I spoke, I spoke at the 2014 Bitcoin conference in Dubai, the first one ever. So I would be honored to do the first decentralized. Yeah, you're, 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 always, you're always a gentleman. I, I, th I throw out some <laughs> crap and you just gently push it back and remind me what an OG you are. Um, <laughs> okay, this, this is short version. This is the pre-show. We're going to do a, a post yeah. or later, maybe in a week or something. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll say this while we're still recording. Can, can you please, let's generate a quick description and links so I can push this out to all the communities, both of us, quickly. Um, yep. Let's pump it to 50,000 views and get the word out and get everyone on Morpheus. This, this sounds, I don't fully understand it all, to be honest, but it, it sounds fascinating. And I, I understand the main points. Just quickly, I don't know if I published it yet, but I did an interview with Roman Gamplonsky, who is a mm. very smart, very methodical AI cautionary voice. So I'd love to get you guys in a shootout. I wouldn't, you know, I'll understand half of it, but that would be sure. a, a great session. Maybe we'll we'll do that in the future. For, you know, or we'll, we'll get we'll, we'll get a three person panel just to make it that, exciting. That that that, that would be a lot. Of, that'd be a lot of fun. That'd be a lot of fun. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, David, thank you for making the time. I know you're slammed. Let's get the description and let's publish. And I'm gonna stop recording. Awesome.